So, first thing you need to know, I know shit about math. I failed out of high school. I didn't do any math classes in high school. I took no math in post-secondary. I didn't go to post-secondary school. I don't know anything, okay? So, take everything I say with a grain of salt. But, I've been doing this for a long time. And um, programming games, that is, for a long time. 3D games, 2D games, whatever. And I've sort of picked up a intuitive understanding of a lot of uh, math concepts um, that I think will be useful for other people. Like, I, ha I, I don't really understand... Like, I went to the Wikipedia page of Quaternions... Like, I went here, right? And I'm like, okay, let's see. Because uh, basically how this started was I was like, hey, um, I post on Twitter. I was like, hey, maybe I'll do some, I'll teach some people some math. Because I, I remember having a lot of trouble. Before, when I was younger, I had a lot of trouble learning. When I was really young, I had a lot of trouble learning math. And, and lately, like, uh, lately I'm having trouble again. But there was a good 10-year period where I was learning math concepts pretty, um, pretty quickly, pretty regularly. And I didn't really have any trouble with them. Quaternions was about the time when I started getting good at learning math. Anyways, so I was like, yeah, if, you, if anybody wants me to teach math from like a game programmer perspective, I can do that. So what do you guys want to learn? And fucking half the people, like I got like 20 people were like, I want to learn Quaternions. And I was like, all right, I can teach Quaternions. So the first thing I did is um, I looked up how other people taught Quaternions. And I've come to the conclusion that no one who's teaching an intro, like an introduction, no no one who's doing an introduction thing on the internet about quaternions understands quaternions at all. There are high level things on the internet that written by people who clearly do know what they're talking about, but all of the introduction stuff was just awful, like Stack Exchange and all of that stuff that people on Stack Exchange linked. It's just just bad, right? So there's clearly a, a lack of a good sort of instruction on how to get an intuitive understanding of how you use quaternions in programming to represent 3D rotations, right? Like, that's a, that, no, I don't think there's a good good example of it, right? So I'm like, this is a perfect topic to, to teach because there isn't a good example. So um, I wrote up what I wanted to talk about and I sent it over to Casey, who is like the, in my opinion, or at, was was at one point the expert on quaternions. And he's like, hey, you missed these things. Uh, you know, exponential mapping and uh, double cover, which is a big thing he wanted to talk about. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll cover double cover. I'm not going to, because um, he did such a good job that there's no reason to do double cover, I don't think. Uh, I'll link you his explanation of double cover. Uh, I'll talk about what it is at the very end, but I'll, I'll link his explanation of it because I, I don't think I have anything to add to that. And exponent mapping, I'm not doing that because I don't understand it. And I didn't really. I, w I was going to learn it, but I was like, no, it's better to keep this to an introduction because I want to keep this to like an hour, maybe an hour and, and a little bit. I don't want this to go too, too long. So I don't want to cover crazy in depth topics. If you want to learn crazy in depth topics, tweet at me and I'll, I'll do it. But um, I think the next thing. So uh, a lot of people ask for uh, vector calculus and uh, linear algebra lessons, so I'll probably do those next. Maybe I'll do a, an advanced quaternion thing if if there's a demand for it. But I think Casey's uh, lecture on double cover sort of covers that quite well. So most of the stuff you read about quaternions on the internet is this garbage, uh, which doesn't make sense to humans. I mean, if you if you understand formal math or whatever, this is probably quite straightforward, but it's not straightforward to me at all. So I'm going to pretend that I didn't see that. All right. So, quaternions. What the fuck are they? Quaternions are just vectors with four components. Their magnitude is one. That's it's all they are, really. Quite simple. So first we're going to talk about uh, rotation in 2D, right? And why why do we even need quaternions, right? Like, if you take a look at a, a 2D rotation, right? So, these are my axes. Uh, I'm going to 
there we go. Look at that. Straight. I'm going to call them X and Y, but uh, that's not a, you know, when you're trying to think about this, you don't want to think in terms of X and Y, but that's fine. For, for our case, it's fine. All right. So, you know, we have a vector, we have a rotation that goes, you know, in this direction, and the common symbol that we use is theta, a Greek symbol theta. And that means a rotation by some amount in this direction, right? Like this is a 90 degree rotation or pi over two radians. It's a 180 degree rotation or pi radians. Or this is a 270 degree rotation or three pi radians. And this is a 360 degree rotation or two pi radians, right? So this is um, sort of how you represent rotations in two dimensions, right? And you'll notice that there is one number. All, ooh, wait, Khan Academy uses lots of colors so let's do the same look at that shit fuck yeah so um uh g rotations in one dimension or two dimensions rather is just theta right and and once you once you have the, the theta you're representing your all all the rotation that you could possibly want in two dimensions right and you're set you're good to go three dimensions is a little bit trickier right so three dimensions, there's there's lots of ways to represent rotations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, if you take a look at the, the first way, which I'll talk about very, very briefly, uh, I'll use x, y, and z again, because that's what you're supposed to do or something. Um, so the first the first method that you you'll probably ever read about is something called Euler angles. And and Euler angles are just a rotation around x, a rotation around y, and a rotation around uh, z, right? These are not a rotation around z. Um, wait, is that right? Who cares? Um, this is a way you can represent rotations, right? So you can imagine if you have an object uh, here, and can we see it? And you want to rotate it around, you know, the, your vertical axis. You can rotate it, you know, a little bit, and then you want to rotate around your horizontal axis or whatever, and you can rotate it. And th that's that's a way of representing rotations. There's a couple of problems with them. Uh, there's a lot of problems with them, right? But the first problem is you can't uh, interpolate. Bad bad for interpolation. And another bad thing about them, the other one that everyone cites as being bad is a thing called gimbal lock, uh, which really isn't that big of a deal. Like People think it's a huge deal, but it's kind of not. It's basically when you rotate one axis so much that it lines up perpendicularly to another axis, and you lose a uh, degree of freedom in your rotation. Like this is because you're three degree of freedom rotation, but if you rotate such that your x and your y axis like line up with each other, you, there's no way to reseparate those axes, and you lose a degree of freedom. Right? You're basically losing a basis vector of rotation. It's not uh, that big of a problem in practice unless you're making like a flight sim or something. But anyways, the fact that you can't interpolate them easily is a really big problem. So uh, the new fad that has been around since probably the early 90s. I think Tomb Raider, the first Tomb Raider is the first time I remember hearing about Quaternions. Maybe they were used before that, probably, but the first time I ever heard about them was from the very first Tomb Raider game on the PlayStation 1. Um, <clears throat> and and quaternions are just a, a way to represent a rotation in 3D in the same way that we use just the number theta in 2D in 2D. In 3D, you know, we'll get our axes back, right? So we, we call this one Y, and we call this one X, and we call this one Z, right? So what normally, how you want to, how, how a way you can think about a rotation in 3D, right, is an axis about which you're rotating, right? So imagine I went over to here, you know, that's some amount on X, you know, some amount on Z, and then I go, you know, some amount on Y, right? And I have this vector here, and it's made of sort of those components, right? And uh, actually, it would be like that. 
I guess. Let's just let's clear up that. All right. Anyways, so you know, you'd you'd say I want to rotate about this axis by some amount, right? So if we even go back and we look at our 2D where we had just an X and a Y, we could say in 3D that like there's an X axis that's coming straight out at us. Uh, is it right hand rule or left hand rule? I don't remember. I don't. I don't know. I. I the Z axis is going straight away from us. Actually, not straight at us. I never remember these things. So the the x axis is go or the z axis rather. Z axis is going straight uh, out from us, and we can rotate about that. Right. That's the same. That's like moving a two dimensional rotation into three D. Right. Because if you think about it, if you have a square like this, right, and you know it exists in this axis here and we rotate it by say 45 degrees you know you get you get like this or whatever that's this if this is a 2d rotation of theta is equal to 45 degrees that's really the same thing as a 3d rotation about the z axis right so um 3D, basically, we want to think about rotations in terms of an axis about which you're rotating and um, and uh, <clears throat> and an angle about which you're rotating, right? So your axis exists in three dimensions, obviously, right? So you have an axis 0, 1, and uh, axis 2. So you're rotating about this axis and you're rotating by theta, right? And you'll notice that this is a four, there are four components, right? And if you put this into a, you make, you know, a vector out of this, you have a four dimensional vector, right? So, um, you know, we can even look at, I wrote this little test program here. So let's look at the little test program. Let me just hide the quaternion interpolation. So if we look at our little test program here, you can see, uh, if you look at this pink, uh, right, this pink one here, that's a rotation about the x-axis, right? So I can actually rotate this around and you can see it being rotated about what would be called the x-axis normally, right? I can move the rotation by about y. I can, you know, move the sphere about which we're rotating. So, you know, we can rotate about anything we want and then rotate by t. But you can see that there are three points that are moving, right, at all times. Or there are three dimensions there are rather four dimensions in which this are moving, right? The axis is moving, so I can move it by amount on the z-axis, I can move it at an amount on the y-axis, and I can move it at an amount on the x-axis, and I can also change its rotation around that axis, right? So there are four there are four components which make up the rotation, right? And that's where quaternions sort of come from, right? There are four component uh, four component vector. Now, what's interesting about quaternions is we deal with unit quaternions, which means their length are one, right? So all quaternions have a length one. If you think about um, a two-dimensional vector, right? So if we have a two-dimensional vector uh, with length one, right? So here's a two-dimensional vector with length one. Here's a two-dimensional vector with length one. Here's a two-dimensional vector with length one. And if we graph all the two-dimensional vectors with length one, you'll get a circle, right? In 3D, if you graph all the three-dimensional vectors with length one, they'll all lie, well, whatever. They'll all lie on a point on a sphere, right? And this is useful because, like, let's say, don't even know how that happened. Let's say that we're trying to interpolate something, right? If we're trying to interpolate around the outside of a circle, that's reasonably easy to do. If we're trying to interpolate around the outside of a sphere, that's again reasonably easy to do, right? So what we want to do, um, well, an interesting thing about these things in 4D, if they're length one, then all of their points exist on the outside of a hypersphere, like a four dimension. It's I call them four dimensional circles because I don't see why we have to come up with names for things but they're called hyperspheres it's just a four-dimensional circle it just means that the any point on the four-dimensional circle is one length from the origin basically right so we can set up our quaternion in any way or we can set up a four dimension there are infinite number of ways we can set up a four-dimensional vector from an axis from a three-dimensional axis a1 
a2, and a theta. So we could set this up in infinite number of ways to get a four-dimensional vector. That's length one, right? We could just do whatever we want and then normalize it, right? So we could do 3a0 a2 a2 squared uh, a1 times pi theta e e to the theta, right? Like we could do this, right? And then we could just normalize it, right? Is that how you, is that the symbol for normalize or is it one? I don't know. I think it's one. I think that means magnitude and that means unit. I don't know. There. So we could do that and then we have ourselves a 4D vector that lies on a hypersphere, right? That's fine. You could do that. You could do anything you want. You could turn your four components. You could just go A0, A1, A2, theta, normalize that, and you're a point on a hypersphere, right? Or a four-dimensional circle. But that doesn't get you anything, right? All it does is it puts you somewhere randomly on a four-dimensional circle. It doesn't put you into any sort of coherent space, right? So the beauty of quaternions is they put you into a coherent space on a four-dimensional circle. So the, you know, the formula for a quaternion is, uh, I'll write it with x notation, right? So it's x, ax, sine theta over 2. So quaternion is ax sine theta over 2, ay sine theta over 2, az sine theta over 2, and then cosine theta over 2. Annotate, uh, normalization, a, yeah. Okay, well, that little hat supposed should mean like unit vector, if I remember correctly, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Me and formal math notation do not get along. So um, this is the actual formula for a quaternion, right? So it takes your axis, and I'm just gonna simplify it by just saying axis of rotation sine theta over two uh, sorry, cosine theta over two, right? So this is this is three parts here. So this is your this is how you construct a quaternion. Now the beautiful thing about what this gives you is this gives you as long as your theta is uh, in the range of zero to seven hundred and twenty, or zero to four pi. As long as your theta is within this range, so two full turns equals one turn around the circumference of the hypersphere, what that means is that every single quaternion maps uniquely to a point on the hypersphere, and every point on the hypersphere is completely covered, right? So every single axis that you can think of, normalized axis that you can think of, and every single angle between zero and two full rotations, 720 degrees, gives you a unique point on the hypersphere. That's, all right, I have just defined that hat. So if I do this, that's a vector. If I do this, that's a unit vector. Unit vector. Unit vector is just the length of it is equal to one. Okay. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> all right. So basically, yes, every, what the quaternion does is it takes every single axis and angle that exists in three dimensions and maps it uniquely onto a point in four dimensions that lives on the edge of a circle. And what that gives us, edge of a four dimensional circle, or hypersphere as they call them. So what that gives us is a really great way in which we can interpolate between different rotations, right? So if I have a rotation around, you know, let's just make it simple, right? So if I have one rotation that's around, um, you know, the x-axis, a rotation of, you know, 90 degrees, and I have another rotation around the y-axis of 35 degrees, for example. This will map to some quaternion. This will map to some quaternion. So we'll call this Q0 and Q1. And we can very conveniently interpolate between those two rotations along the circumference of the hypersphere, right? 
and that's fantastic, right? This allows us to have a rotation, like let's say we're playing a flight sim game and I'm looking this way, but I want to look over here. That gives us a very smooth path, which we can both, you know, rotate the ship and the direction that we're looking in one sort of smooth arc, right? Another thing that it does that's really important for character animation is it allows us to blend and quaternions, right? We can take, let's say I have, a, you know, a joint, uh, an animation where my hand is down and then I'm moving my hand up or like something more complicated. Uh, my hand is down and I'm moving my hand to point a gun because guns are what we do in video games. But in the meantime, like my arm moves back a little bit or something like that. And in that, there's like five or six keyframes that exist and you sort of interpolate blend between that whole like track of animation poses. There might be 10 quaternions that you're interpolating between and that's 10 different anim or that's 10 different rotations that exist per bone per joint and you can interpolate between all 10 of those in one go because all 10 of those points you're able to all 10 of those quaternions or all 10 of those rotations you're able to map to points on a hypersphere and then just linearly blend between them and it's like it's it it solves all every single problem with 3D rotation that I've ever encountered are solved with quaternions. Uh, there are other, there are problems that I haven't had to deal with that quaternions do not solve eloquently. So, um, if you've ever taken a flight, this was sort of the most pronounced time that this has ever happened to me, is I was on a flight from Toronto to Frankfurt, and, um, uh, oh, I should actually ask, does is this all make sense? Am I... Have I explained this well? Have I explained it like how I have like a sort of an intuition for this? Because I feel like all of the instructions that I've ever read about quaternions, like all of the introductory topics that I've ever read about quaternions on the internet, didn't explain any of the shit that I just explained. And this is sort of the this is sort of like what's really important about them. Does anybody have any questions, or does does everything make sense so far? I know there's just quite a big stream delay actually, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for this two full rotations okay I'll um, mathematically I have absolutely no idea why uh, I don't I mean like other than the obvious fact that the quaternion is a uh, sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2 other than like the fact that these twos are here, that's as far as the why it's two dimensions that I understand, or why it's two full rotations that I understand. There is a physical reason why. Um, tau is stupid, and tau is stupid because in the real world, at the quantum mechanical level at least, and I can show you, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this. I'm taking off my belt. And try to do this. Paul Dirac. There's this guy, Paul Dirac. He's a particle physicist. Came up with all sorts of shit. Signal processing stuff. Some cool shit. You do not get two angles that give the same value with um, with quaternions. And uh, there's a thing called double cover, and I'm not going to explain it much. I'll link you to Casey's explanation because I believe he's the first person to ever do it. So I'm going to teach you the belt trick. I think I think uh, Elephant knows the belt trick. So Paul Dirac had this belt trick. And basically what he used it to do is prove that in the physical real world there is a distinction between a 360 degree rotation and a, and a 720 degree rotation. When you look at particle physics and you look at the spin of no, I'm not doing a Mobius strip. Uh, when you look at the spin of electrons, you can have or spin of fundamental particles. I think an electron has a f half spin. Anyways, so you're talking about the orientation of particles as though there were strings attached to the end of them, and there is a difference in the real physical world between a 360 degree rotation and a 100 and a 720 degree rotation. So, no, I'm saying that one full rotation is four pi and two and and two tau. That's why I think tau is stupid because rotations are actually 720 degrees in the physical world. We're just too stupid to see it. 
So if you take this belt, can you see the belt? Okay, you can see. So if you take this belt, and I'm going to twist it twice, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate here so you can actually see. So I'm doing one, okay, I've just done a 360 degree rotation of the belt, okay? So I've, I've taken one end and I've twisted it 360 degrees, right? And I'm going to take it, and see if I do this right, and I'm going to put it under the side, and you'll notice that the belt is still twisted, okay? So the belt is still twisted after doing 360 degrees of rotation. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. So that's 180. That is uh, 360. That's 540. And that's 720 degrees. I've now done two full rotations of the belt. I'm going to do the exact same procedure where I just take it, and I stick it under the other end, and I pull it straight, and the belt is no longer twisted. Definitive proof that in the physical world, there is a distinction between 360 degree rotations and 720 degree rotations. When you get into particle physics and you get down to the really sort of small, even like theoretical particles that we aren't sure exist or whatever, they're all defined in terms of two full rotations is different from one full rotation. If that's why that mapping to... Uh, if that's why that mapping to three, um, to, to, to two full rotations is why quaternions are like that, then that's fucking cool. But I don't actually know. Yes, you can do it by rotating something in your hand, but my shoulder doesn't move that way. I've seen videos of it, though. It's pretty cool. Quick question. Uh, do I have to worry about losing information moving back into three dimensions? No, because you're never, you're never moving back into three dimensions, right? We're not taking, like, this is... This was the thing that I think people who are teaching quaternions don't quite understand, otherwise they would explain it. And hopefully I can explain it to you. So if I can't, keep asking me, because I'll do my best. You're not taking a three-dimensional point, right? Like the rotation, it's just like in 2D, right? In 2D, you had a theta. Let me see if I can draw this a little bit nicer, right? In two dimensions, you had just an angle, right? You had a theta angle of rotation, right? That's not a point, right? That isn't intrinsically a point. I mean, you can do e to the... Ignoring Euler's formula, this isn't a point, right? This is just a rotation, right? It doesn't mean a physical point, right? If you were to construct a vector out of this, like if you were to go cosine theta plus... cosine theta x plus sine theta y, for example, then you've taken your point, you've taken your rotation, which is not a point, and you've turned it into a point, right? So this is taking a theta of a rotation defined as a single number theta into a point. This is a 2D vector. This is like this is how you do this. But if you're just talking about the rotation itself, like the actual representation, the mathematical representation of the rotation, it's just a point, right? Quaternions are the 3D equivalent of just this point, right? So in 2D, you need just the theta. In 3D, you need an axis and a theta. So when you move it, an axis, a 3D axis plus a theta, is this is represented with one number, right? This is represented with four numbers. So you're never actually going from two dimensions or from three dimensions to four dimensions. Your rotation is always a four-part vector, right? It's always your rotation about x, y, and z, and then a rotation, or it's always an axis defined in x, y, and z, and then a rotation around it, right? It's never a point in three dimensions, right? So when we're doing any operations on these quaternions, we're doing it, we, we turn our four numbers that are required to do the operations, our three axes and four numbers, we turn that into a vector that just happens to nicely map onto a four-dimensional circle or a hypersphere. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just axis plus angle. Is that clear? I feel like that's probably the thing that's missing 
from most explanations on quaternions. Okay, is everybody, are we clear up to this point? Is everybody happy? Does everybody like this? Are we all happy? Do we understand that the quaternion is just the 2D equivalent of just a theta? All right, cool. So let's switch colors here just for fun because I want to be conned so badly. Um, all right. I'm going to talk about... Handmade HMH bots here. All right, then. So I'm going to talk about uh, great arcs now. Um, so... When I was flying, I was going to get to the story where I was flying from uh, Toronto to Frankfurt. And um, on the airline that I was on, you could you had a screen on your TV, you had a TV right in front of you, and there was a map button, and you could see the map. And the map basically drew the flight path for the plane and where we were, right? And at one point, my wife looked at it, and we were basically, we were just about... We were almost up to Iceland, right? According to this... Um... Okay, Jesus, I have to stop reading the chat. Um, <laughs> we, we, were, we were on a point, and it looked like we were just about to the point of Iceland, right? And that's crazy, because Toronto and Frankfurt are quite a bit further south than Iceland. So why were we up so high, right? Well, one of the reasons was when you project a globe, it's all fuckery, and you don't actually go that high. But another reason, or the, it's the same sort of same reason, is that when you take a globe and you project it flat, what you think is a straight line, um, like it looks like a straight line between two points, that's not actually the straightest line around a circle, right? So if you take a sphere, which I should have actually brought a ball, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go get a ball, because this will help. I'll be right back. Sorry, I guess that was on. All right. Yeah, I know, I just muted myself. Are we good now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Are we good now? Are we all right? Are we happy? Can you hear me? Hello? <laughs> I assume that everybody can hear me. Continue. Okay, we're Gucci. Okay. All right. So when you look at a point on a sphere, right? Let's say I'm going between... Can we see? Can we... There's one point. Where's the other? Oh, my God. I'm trying to do it backwards in a mirror. Holy shit. Life's hard. Okay. So, yeah. Anyways, two points. And if we go... Connect the dots. We're traveling along this sphere, right? This arc, or this line, the shortest distance between two points all along the surface of a sphere, is called uh, a great arc. And great arcs have a few interesting properties. Uh, the first interesting property is they are coplanar, as any two vectors would be, or it 
they sorry all the points lie on a plane right so if you take the sphere and you get to the very center of the sphere and you were to create a vector that goes from the very center of the very center of the sphere out from one point and then out to the other point you will define a plane with those two vectors and that plane imagine uh imagine a sheet of paper here that goes through the center slices right through here and then connects this point to this point all the points of that great circle of that great arc lie on the projected 2d vector if that makes sense right or the projected 2d plane right so this pl this is a plane it's an infinite plane as you can tell from its finiteness this infinite plane if it went through the sphere that's very solid and can't be cut and connected each point of this through the great arc that would be constructed with two vectors let me see if I can do draw it here right so we have our circle we have one point here one point here this is the center of the circle we construct a vector here and we construct a vector here v0 and v1 as you can see this vector is particularly straight these define a plane as any two vectors that are not collinear define a plane and that plane exists through the sphere connecting these two points the two points that we want to go between and all the points of the great circle or great arc that connect these two points along the outside so if you can imagine that and this is a sphere and this is the origin this plane that's defined by these two vectors all the points of the great arc that connect v1 and v0 through the minimal path along the outside of the circle called the great arc that great arc there all those points will lie exactly on that plane defined by those two vectors does that make sense are we happy about that does that make sense I'm gonna assume that that makes sense because uh, that's I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that now what you've learned about vectors hopefully is that two any two vectors that are non collinear define a plane right so as long as they're linearly independent as in if one vector is here and the other vector lies directly on top of it if this is v0 and v1 these two are obviously collinear they don't define a plane literally any other two vectors define a plane right so we know that these two define a plane the cool thing about any n-dimensional sphere whether it's four dimensional three dimensional seven dimensional okay sorry hold on I don't actually know if this works for n dimensional but I know it works in three four and seven and we only care about three and four so we know it works in three and four I believe it works in everything but I'm not a mathematician and didn't prove it but three four and seven it works right did Levi sponsor elite dangerous what what the fuck are you talking about what the fuck are you talking about I don't know what the fuck this guy's talking about. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> what is seven-dimensional? Uh, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. Like, this should work for any dimensions, right? But we're concerned with seven and four dimensions. So anyways, the point is that even on the outside of a uh, hypersphere the shortest point along the outside of a hypersphere is still it still lies on a plane right and we can define that plane simply by two quaternions because quaternions remember are 4d vectors right so if quaternions if a quaternion is a 4d vector and there's two quaternions that are not collinear we know that defines a plane right it doesn't matter how many dimensions this is right you can have a vector with 36 dimensions if you have two of them it still defines a plane right there's still one plane that is defined by those two vectors right so if we have two planes that are or two uh, quaternions that are um, two quaternions that exist that are not collinear they define a plane and 
the shortest distance between those two vec between those two quaternions on the outside of the hypersphere is exactly the uh, lie exactly on the plane, just like I showed in this example with three dimensions in this thing, right? It's the exact same thing, right? Does that make sense to everybody? This example here, plane going through three-dimensional sphere. If you take this plane and you go through a four-dimensional sphere, I can't show you that. I have no idea what that looks like. It doesn't matter. The point is that the math for three dimensions and four dimensions are the exact same, right? So if we take a, we take a plane and we slice the sphere along two quaternions, then we have a plane that all points along the great arc between those two quaternions will lie on, right? So, if we're happy with that, then I can explain to you what slurp is, because that's all slurp is. <clears throat> you have probably heard of slurp, because I think there's a slurp button in Unity. And um, so since there's a slurp button in Unity, everybody uses slurp. So let's talk about slurp, because I just explained it. Slurp is a function that takes uh, two quaternions, q0, q1, and a t value, where t is between 0 and 1. And all it does is it basically walks along the outside of a hypersphere exactly in the same way that we do in 3D. You have to imagine this is 4D, which you can't do because no one can. I don't think. Maybe some people can. I don't know. But anyway, so if this was a 4D circle, imagine walking along the outside of a 4D circle. The path that that 4D circle takes is defined to be on a plane because there's only two things that you're going between, right? So we can just create slurp. That's not particularly hard, right? So if we were to draw our coordinate system now, and instead of x and y, let's call the this basis axis, let's just call this q0, okay? So this is our first quaternion, right? And now, you know, maybe here, this is quaternion 1, for example, right? <clears throat> and uh, we can get the theta between quaternion 1 as the cosine inverse of q0 dot q1, right? So if you take the dot product and you get the cosine inverse, you get theta. Let's try to draw that just a touch nicer. So the theta between the two is that. And whatever our output theta that we want, right? So this is our in this is our theta zero. And our theta output is gonna be uh, theta zero times t. So all we want to do is find, you know, maybe maybe t is 0 0.5. Let's just, for, for example's sake, say that our t is 0 0.5, just so it draws nicely, right? So t is 0 0.5. That means that the actual theta that we want to find is, you know, let's try to get halfway between them, or reasonably close to halfway between them, right? That's about halfway, sure. Right? So this is our theta 1 here, right? Now, this Q0 is not, you know, your x-axis, right? Like, because remember, it's a 4D vector. It's not this, right? It doesn't matter what Q0 is, right? The rules of linear algebra apply regardless to whether this is defined as, you know, your standard. I think this is called standard basis, if it was the straight x-axis. I think that's called standard basis, but we don't care. We're not using standard basis. We're not, this is just, this exists in some plane arbitrarily floating in four dimensions that you can't possibly see. And um, one point of that plane is like, we'll call this zero and one, right? So we have point zero and point one. If we have this plane here, I'm drawing here, this is 0 and this is 1. So this plane is exactly chopped right through here. This is the origin. I'll write origin. All right, can we see? 0, 1, 0, 1, 
stick it right through here. That plane is that. And this path along here is like the path along the great circle is this path here, right? That's how it works in 3D. It works the exact same in 4D, but you just, you can't visualize it. I can't visualize it. Maybe you can, but it's not important. All that matters is that the math is consistent between n dimensions. So all we want to do then is find this quaternion here, right? We have Q0, we have Q1. We can easily figure out what theta we want. So all we have to do is find out what this quaternion is, which I'll just call capital Q, because why not? Well, how do we do that, right? Like this is this is actually pretty standard um, complex number analysis or Euler's formula. If you look up Euler's formula, uh, Euler's formula, Euler's formula. So if you look up Euler's formula, you get this little bitch here, right? It's actually not Euler's formula. Well, it is. Whatever. <clears throat> it's kind of not. It kind of is. Um, pretend I didn't say Euler's formula because that introduces complex numbers and we don't even need to think about complex numbers. All we want to do basically is get two basis vectors which we can then define a number on the plane with, right? And we're going to use our input, our first input vector as the first basis vector. And then if we can find this basis vector here, we'll call this Q uh, n, because it'll be the normal, it'll be normal to this. If we can get this basis vector here, then we can define, we can figure out what this number here is, right? And it's relatively easy to get this basis vector, right? We want, uh, not only, sorry, in addition to having just this basis vector, we want a thing called an orthonormal, orthonormal basis. And orthonormal just means it's orthogonal to all the other basis vectors and it's normalized, meaning it has a unit length one, right? So if this, if Q0 is one basis vector and Qn is the other basis vector, then uh, Q0 dot Q1, uh, sorry, Qn should be zero and the length of Qn should be one. Right. If we if these if this is satisfied, then we have what are called orthonormal bases. Both of these vectors are going to be on the plane, and therefore any linear interpolation on the plane of around theta will give us the point on the hypersphere that's between two quaternions. Does that make sense? We don't even need cross product. That's just way too advanced. It's also not defined in four dimensions, but you know. <clears throat> It's defined in seven dimensions, though. Go figure. So how do we get Qn, right? This is pretty straightforward linear algebra. Uh, I'll do it here. So if we take, um, if we just project, you'll have to forgive me. I don't remember the syntax. I think it's, I think this is correct. If we project Q1 onto Q0, I don't know. I never use, who fucking cares? Q0 dot Q1 times Q0, right? <clears throat> so what that gives us, if we take Q0 dot Q1, we get some scalar, and its length is going to be whatever length this is. And we multiply it by Q1, we get this vector. Right, so we'll call this A. Right, so we now have A. Shit, that looks like a Q. So we have, fuck. So that gives us A, right? If we take Q1 and we subtract A from it, let's get a different color here. Let's get some yellow action here, right? Let's call this B. B is equal to Q1 minus A. And what does that give us? Well, that gives us this vector here, right? And if we draw it at standard position, we have this, right? That's A. Well, if we just A is equal to A over the length of A, we get 
Well, hold on. Let's do something that's super cool here. Let's just make this QN. So if we go QN is equal to A over the length of A. We have our fucking orthonormal basis. That's it. That's all there is to it, right? So now we have Q0 and we have QN and we have a theta. Now, who fucking cares is actually the mathematical formula for finding some of my life achievements? Yeah, pretty much. So we have Q, we have an orthonormal basis Q0. We have an ortho, uh, we have two basis vectors that are orthonormal to each other Q0 and Qn, right? So if we want to find our output Q, let's draw it in white because white contrasts well with black. Our output Q is just our cosine of the theta, and we've theta one, right? That's this theta one here, which is just the input theta multiplied by t, which is the percentage between the two vectors, cosine theta 1 q0 plus sine theta 1 q1. That's it. That's slurp. That really complex, crazy, four-dimensional, complex number shit that everybody talks about being super complicated or whatever, that's it. That's all there is to it. It's not complicated. It's very simple. All it is is straightforward linear algebra. And what makes it complicated is people who don't understand how to work with linear algebra outside of coordinate systems explaining it, I think at least. When I first learned this, the thing that I found really difficult was wrapping my head around what the fuck people were talking about because no one was talking about it what it actually was they were drawing like I'm pretty sure if you go to Wikipedia quaternion slurp I'm pretty sure if you go here you're gonna get oh that's actually not so bad yeah here so you're gonna get this nonsense right well okay it's actually quite simple all right I give up the 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 yeah okay here here's this is the nonsense that you get you get this crap you see this shit what the fuck is this right like this is what you get when you look up slurp on the internet right you get this junk and this is makes no fucking sense right if you can make sense of this good for you but i can't make sense like what the who cares about this right like this is just this is just a pain in the ass to work with, right? Like, no one cares about any of this shit. This, actually, this isn't so bad. But anyways. Yeah, really, right? Like, who cares? This this seems pretty reasonable. But anyways, that's all that slurp is. All it is, is you find the plane. You, you just, you have the plane, because you have two quaternions. Two, any two 4D vectors that are not collinear define a plane. So you have a plane... The great arc around the circle is your interpolation, is, is your shortest distance between two points along your 4D circle. Your plane, all, all those points also exist on the plane. Then all you have to do is orthonormalize two basis vectors, find your input, which is just T, to, or find your output theta, which is just T times your input theta, get your orthonormal vector basis, and then you do Euler's little formula here to get your output quaternion this is some sort of a trigonometry identity or, or something there's something triggish in here but i don't really know anything about formal stuff right what the fuck is this an array of quadratic forms i don't know i don't know what it was and i don't want to know what that is all i know is this is all slurp is is everybody comfortable with slurp now does anybody have any problems with the idea of slurp and how it works and all that stuff. Does everybody did everybody find that reasonably straightforward? Like cherry slurp, yeah, cherry slurp's good. Is everybody cool with slurp now? Could everybody go and write a slurp function? Quite clear. Good, good. Okay, so we're all happy with slurp. Okay. Okay, 
So, how about now? Everybody good with Slurp now? This isn't so true. This probably was true 10 years ago when this... Jonathan Blow and Casey were all about not using Slurp like 10 years ago. It's not so true anymore. Uh, computers are fast enough that you don't really need to worry about the computation of Slurp. I'm going to keep it here anyway. Uh, computers are so fast that you don't really need to worry about using the computation of Slurp. But there are there is there is a fundamental problem with Slurp. So when you're trying to blend quaternions, you have three parameters by which you're trying to blend them, right? Your first parameter is, I think the term is commutative. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at formal math. That's where like AX plus B... Wait, AX... What does it mean? It's like AX... A... Oh, wait. ABC is equal to... Yeah, yeah, ABC is equal to BCA is equal to CAB... Whatever. It means that, like, the order... Yeah, yeah, that's what it means. Does that what commutative means? Commutative... I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I, I don't know formal math at all. Like, even... Even a little bit. Slurp is basically slope in 4D. Uh, no, slurp is basically a rotation around a circle in 2D. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Commutative. That's the yeah. Com co commutative. Oh, it's commutative. Oh, <laughs> commutative. I told you I don't know shit about formal math. So, com. Utative. Okay. <laughs> Shouldn't learn anything from me. Commutative. Okay. Uh, so that's one property that's desirable when rotating, when when interpolating between uh, slurp, is that property. Another property is a thing called torque minimal. Torque minimal. And I don't want to get into what torque min. I don't want to get into what torque is, but. Um, you can imagine if you have this great arc, if this great arc is the smallest distance between these two points, that's torque minimal. If your great arc did something ridiculous like this, where it wasn't the shortest distance across the hypersphere, or across the sphere, or across anything, that would not be torque minimal. That would be random. And then your third property is... Oh, uh, constant velocity. Okay, so you have, these are the three properties, matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication can be, <laughs> in certain situations. Um, right, so these are your three properties that you have to, these are your three desirable properties when cho choosing a method for blending between quaternions, right? You either want, you want all three of these, right? Unfortunately, this is not possible. As far as we know, mathematics has not given us, gotten us to the point where you can have all three of these, right? You can have two of them. And depending on which two you want, you have to pick a method, right? The three methods that I know about, at least with regards to mapping things onto four-dimensional surfaces, the three methods that I know about are uh, slurp, and lerp, which is just normalized lerp. And for the handmade hero people out there, Casey made this famous, or made this viable. So you can thank him. And the other is called uh, an exponent map. And I don't know shit about them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Because I'll say wrong stuff, and I don't want to sound like an idiot. I've said, everything I've said is probably wrong. But, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. Commutative. 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 That's the word. Commutative. <laughs> Slurp. Nope. And lerp. Yep. Yep. Torque minimal. Yep. Yep. Nope. Constant velocity. Yep. Nope. Yep. Pick two. You don't have it. You can't get all three, right? So 
Um, so if you have torque minimal and constant velocity, so torque minimal and constant velocity, right? Uh, well, the problem is, so for slurp that gives you torque minimal and constant velocity, if you have two rotations, if you only have two rotations, use slurp. Slurp is fine. When Jonathan Blow and Casey went on the anti-slurp tirade of ten, it's twelve or thirteen years ago at this point, it was because it was because both. Um, you couldn't blend more than one animation, and also because slurp's kind of inefficient. There's you have to take a bunch of arc cosines and arc. You have to take a sine, a cosine, and an arc, and an arc, and an arc cos. Right? I think I think that's all you have to take. But you have to take uh, quite a few operations, right? And that's really slow. But like nowadays, computers are so fucking fast. Who cares? So if you have two rotations, slurp is fine. But if you have like six rotations that you're blending from, you simply cannot use slurp. Because like if you have, if you look at like any animation system, right? So if you have an animation system, right? You might have like... You'll have a weight and a quaternion. Weight and a quaternion. A weight and a quaternion. So let's say you have three, right, and a and a quaternion, right. So if you, you have three quaternions and the sum, let's see if I can sum weight. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I'm gonna use proper mathematical notation. I can't even remember where the fucking start point and end point go. <laughs> the sum of your weight, weight zero plus weight one, is equal to one. Um, I have actually written. Using Granny Source, I have written dual quaternion blending for skinning. Uh, so I can talk about that uh, if you want. After I do this, I can talk about dual quaternion skinning if you want. I have written that. Uh, it's it's okay. I'm not I'm not sold on it. But anyways, so if all your weights are equal to one, this is a common thing that you're going to do in um, animation blending, right? If you have four quaternions you simply cannot slurp them, right? Because if your animation program ordered them Q2, Q1, Q0, Q3, and it did like slurp these two, and then slurp these two, and then slurp this whole thing, right? Like this, this type of a thing, you're gonna get a different result than if your Q if these were reversed or if it did like slurp these two and then slurp this and then slurp this. Like once you start dealing with more than two quaternions, slurp is broken. It's not well defined at all. So what Casey and I believe he's the first to do it, he doesn't think he is, but I'm gonna give him credit. What he figured out is you just fucking do this shit. You just wait. You got like a big Q at the end of that, and then you just fucking normalize it. And then you're done. And this is called normalized. Lerp. is the dumbest fucking thing possible. It's just straight up add up your quaternions and then normalize them. Right? So even if you don't have weights, right? Let's look at the difference between slurp and lerp here, right? So let's see let's go back to our previous example here. Right? Whoa, let's, let's whoa, okay. Simmer down. Straight line time. So, you know, we said this was Q0, and whatever, this is Q1, right? So if you slurp, you know, you're going across, you're going around the outside of a sphere, right? <clears throat> Basically what lerping does, like, so let's say this is your Q, this is your output Q here, okay? What lerping does is it just goes, like, barrels through the hypersphere 
just as you would barrel through a circle, right? So imagine that this is just on a circle. It just barrels through the circle and you know, you get maybe this vector, which is a little bit off and then you just push it out and then you're back on the circle, right? So what I said before that, I think, I said that you don't get constant velocity. What that basically means is um, with your end lerp, 50% of the way, well, 50% of the way through is correct. 25% of the way through, so if you're lerping, let's say you're lerping exactly from 0 to pi over 2. Come on, John, you can do, fuck off. There we go. So let's say you're lerping, you're going here, right? Your slurp is going to get you exactly here. It's going to be dead on. You're going to get exactly constant velocity, right? You're going to be moving the exact same amount correctly, right? For a normalized lerp, you're going to basically take this vector path. You're going to take this path at 25%. Maybe that's here, for example. And then you're going to push yourself back out. That's the normalization part of it here. So you're going to be off by a little tiny bit, right? The actual amount that you're off is incredibly small. Like it's really, really small and it doesn't matter, right? There's also, people have done spline fitting algorithms where in you take slurp, or sorry, if slurp is defined as Q0, Q1, T, you do an n lerp of Q0, Q1, and then like some sort of a T where F is some sort of a curve function that basically if you map um, uh, uh, 1 t f of t so if you just do a linear lerp you get that but if you do there's I forget what the curve looks like it looks something like this Let's see if we can exaggerate it a little bit at 0 0.5, your your lerp is going to be correct, but at anything else in between, your lerp is going to be a little bit off, and the point at which it's off is uh, halfway between uh, halfway between uh, 0 0.5, so quarter uh, six, eighth pi, and then multiples of eighth pi. That is where you're going to be off the most. But if you get a, a curve function that fits this reasonably well, you can get n lerp to look really, 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 really close to slurp, and you can benefit from the property where you can take a hundred different quaternions, blend them all together, add them all up, and then normalize that shit, and you're really, really close to your slurp function, which you can't even do if you have multiple quaternion blending. Does all that make sense? That one makes the most intuitive sense, IMO but I feel like you'd lose a bit of information when you renormalize. You do, you, you, that's right, you do lose a little bit of, uh, of information when you renormalize, like you're a little bit off, but the amount that you're off is just, it doesn't matter. If you have like, if you have like a camera that's like, it's hard to draw, it's hard to, um, if you're just doing this, this is just an axis, it doesn't include the rotation. So I'm going to try, uh, deodorant. So if you have like uh, a rotation that looks like this and then you blend it to a rotation that looks like this or whatever, like the amount that your your n lerp is off is really, really small and it usually doesn't matter. If you're doing like a flight sim or any sort of a simulation, maybe it matters then. But you're using, if you're only blending between two quaternions, just go ahead and use slurp. It's fine. And if you're not blending between two quaternions, you're probably doing something with character animation, where your, your, your animation track has, you know, 15 keyframes or whatever, and you're blending between each of those. Who cares, right? Like, you don't even know what your animation program did, right? Your animation program could have done something completely different than what you're going to have in the game. So it doesn't really matter whether your end lerp matches up with slurp exactly because your animation program probably didn't use slurp either so it it doesn't matter at that point 
I didn't expect to actually learn something new about quaternions watching this, but I did. Thanks. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you were able to watch something. Now, the other thing that I'm not going to talk about because it's already gone on for about an hour and 15 minutes, and I said I wanted to keep it around an hour, is a thing called quaternion double cover. And basically, what quaternion double cover does is it uses the property of quaternions that because we take theta over 2, a quaternion actually represents two full rotations around something. And it uses that property to determine which way. Like if you have an arm. Let me see if I can fucking draw. God damn it. I said I wasn't going to do this. That's a dude, right? So if you have the guy and his arm is like up here. I'd have to draw it in 3D. I'm not doing it. Basically, if you have an arm that's impossible, if you if you have a joint that's impossible to move, but the shortest path through that point is actually through an impossible way, normally you'd have to do like angular constraints and you'd have to do a whole bunch of difficult, complicated, brittle algorithms. Like if you've ever seen, there's a, it's a pretty famous GIF file of uh, famous, but there's a, a pretty common GIF file. I've seen it many times on the internet. It's like a, a WWE referee, and he like does a thumbs up or something like that, and his head spins around, and his arm is all broken or whatever. <clears throat> all of that shit is um, uh, that those like weird sort of like impossible rotations are usually done t are usually due to broken angular constraints on. Uh, on interpolated animations. What Quaternion Double Cover does is it uses... Like when you author an animation for something, you there's a rest pose, like it's a generic pose. Sometimes it's a T pose where your arms are like this. Or sometimes it's a rest pose where it's just like the most natural position for you to rest. And basically it figures out whether you're in a 360 degree rotation of the rest pose or not. And it makes sure that it never jumps 360 degrees past where you are in the rest pose so that you always take the shortest path possible and it's this technique called um, where IK breaks I mean yeah I'm not gonna look at these videos but yes basically um, that stuff is really yeah this stuff you see it all the time right and most of the time it's due to broken angular constraints what Casey figured out 10, 12 years ago is that you can use the rest pose for a comparison function, basically, to determine whether or not what the actual shortest path is, right? Because you might have a shortest path, like if you have a rotation and you're considering it just on 360 degrees, you might be here and you want to get here and like clearly this is shorter, like this is much shorter than going all the way around. But if this actually implies that you'd have to do all of this because you're using two rotations, then this way is clearly shorter. And you can figure this out just with a dot product with uh, the same quaternion. Uh, it's not the dot product with the quaternion. Well, yeah, the dot product with the quaternion versus the rest pose. You can figure out whether or not you need to go this way or all the way around, right? You'll never ever want to go all the way around. So you can figure out that using uh, comparing yourself to the rest pose. And there's a thing called double cover. And uh, I, I, I don't want to explain it because there's nothing that I will say that Casey didn't already say. So what I'm going to do is mollyrocket.com quaternion double cover and the rest pose neighborhood. Where's my mouse? If you go here. There. I said this was going to be an introduction to um, quaternions, so I don't want to cover advanced topics like this. I'm not going to like do in-depth stuff about dual quaternion skinning either for the exact same reason. If you want me to teach you dual quaternion skinning, let me know. I'll do it in another video. This was supposed to be an introduction. But yeah, um, if you're doing animations using quaternions, then you probably, like character animation using quaternions, you probably do want to learn about double cover. 
I have nothing to add that he didn't already say. Uh, his video didn't have an introduction to Quaternions. His video only had the double cover thing, so I figured it would be good to augment that with an introduction to Quaternions. So I have nothing left that I was going to say about all this. Um, if anybody has questions, please let me know. I'll gladly answer them. Um, I hope it seems like people seem to get some sort of a an intuition or understanding of quaternions and slurp and and what they are that maybe they didn't have before. So that's good. I feel pretty good about that. Did anybody find anything confusing? I can I can try to explain um, anything if anybody's struggling with anything. Another stream lag, so I'll wait. You have a bunch of questions. Yeah, please go ahead, ask. Whatever those questions are. will gladly answer as much as I can. If you have like formal math questions, you don't don't even bother. Uh, I don't I don't know anything about formal math. But like you know. I mean, I didn't even know what the fuck this word was. Like, come on. I'm really tempted to draw a penis while I wait for questions to be asked.